I'm in Jerry and welcome back to Onyx Pages. Uh, so in 2018, last year, which I can now say, I had the honor and privilege of attending WizCon. This was the 42nd convention of feminist science fiction, which was held in, wait for it, Wisconsin, um, in the US of A. It was a really amazing experience. I met a lot of really wonderful people, had a lot of really great conversations, um, read, read a lot of really interesting books, bought a bunch of interesting books, and was able to conduct a number of interviews, only one of which I've, only two of which I've actually uploaded. So one is the interview with Tanana Reeve Du, and the other was the in interview with Kay Tempest Bradford. Um, there's another interview that I did which was with Andrea Harrison and Andrea Harrison is many things she's an author she's an actor she is uh, a professor of the arts she also has a science and math background and she also has a background in like back the back end of theater production um, she I first learned about her when I read Redwood and Wildfire and Redwood and Wildfire was actually the first book that I um, reviewed on Onyx Pages in August of 2017 and as I look back on that video it's a very humbling one um, but I you know what we all we all learn and grow uh, but I really and I actually think different things about this book now that I've read a bunch of other books. But anyway, that um, book warmed my heart and it was really wonderful to have the opportunity so many months later to talk to Andrea about her story, about her approach to writing. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about her is that it was very important for her and her writing to have African descended peoples, to have European descended peoples, to have indigenous peoples all together interacting in the same plot in the same set and so there was a huge cast of characters from all over the place interacting in this book redwood and wildfire so i'm gonna leave it there you can go and take a look at one of my first videos um no judgment and uh and find out more about the book and what i thought of it but i thought it was really wonderful so before i get into the interview with andrea i also want to share with you a few other books and i want to announce a little giveaway so in addition to Redwood and Wildfire, there was also, I mean, she's written a lot, but there is, I picked this up at Wisconsin as well. This is Lonely Stardust, and I'm just going to read the back. Lonely Stardust, two plays, a speech, and eight essays brings us the text of nine marvelous works of scholarly performance, as well as two works of drama in which the fantastic shows us the way through despair. In several of the pieces here, Hairston's sharp, visionary eye examines Hollywood blockbusters and finds a great deal to think about, even as she impatiently slices through hackneyed, received views that do popular culture and its fans no favors. Taken together, these essays and plays broadcast a message of hope and intelligence that defiantly insists that our ability and desire to tell stories defines our humanity and is one of our most valuable resources. So that is Lonely Stardust. The next is Mindscape, again by Andrea Hairston. The barrier will not be ignored. For 115 years, this extraterrestrial epidimensional entity has divided the Earth into warring zones. Although a treaty to end the interzonal wars has been hammered out, power-hungry politicians, gangsters, and spiritual fundamentalists are determined to thwart it. Celestina, the treaty's architect, is assassinated. And her protege, Eleni, a talented renegade and one of the few able to negotiate the barrier, takes up her mantle. Now, Eleni and a motley crew of allies risk their lives to make the treaty work. Can they repair their fractured world before the barrier devours them completely? This is cool. Nice. Apparently, this is the first novel. Andrea Harrison's first novel. It was this was blurbed by Cherie Renee Thomas, Greg Bear, Pearl Cleage. So this mindscape was hmm, published in 
2006. So maybe, maybe it was her first. Anyway, this is Mindscape. So I'm looking forward to reading this and you should take a look at it. The final book that I want, that I have here in the flesh, in the pages, uh, is Will Do Magic for Small Change. And this was published in 2016. So Cinnamon Jones dreams of stepping on stage and acting her heart out like her famous grandparents Redwood and Wildfire. But at 5'10 and 180 pounds, she's theatrically challenged. Her family life is a tangle of mystery and deadly secrets, and nobody is telling Cinnamon the whole truth. Before her older brother died, he gave Cinnamon the Chronicles of the Great Wanderer, a tale of a Dahomean warrior woman and an alien from another dimension who perform in Paris and at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The Chronicles may be magic or alien science, but the story is definitely connected to Cin Cinnamon's family secrets. When an act of violence wounds her family, Cinnamon and her theater squad determine to solve the mysteries and bring her worlds together. So this book was written, I, it, I believe it's a prequel to this one. So these two books are related, Redwood and Wildfire and Will Do Magic for Small Change. And, and Redwood and Wildfire, published in 2011. So this came first, this came after, but I think this tells the story. Oh, maybe this follows, this follows it. Don't listen to anything I just said. These books are together, so read them together. All right, now Andrea, being the lovely, generous writer that she is, gave me another copy of Will Do Magic for Small Change. So if you would like a copy, of will do magic for small change then what do you have to do you have to write a haiku write a haiku because haiku is my favorite kind of poem and they're really easy it's just a five seven five rhythm the first line has five beats the second line has seven beats and the third line has five beats five seven five that's all you got to do it can be about anything right can you give an example no because okay. I can't, I can't think that. Okay, let me think of a haiku. That's just. Okay. Um, Afro future. No, that's even six. Yo, I think you just do the haiku. Science fiction is. So that's five. A portal. Through time and space. Yes. We should read it now. That's there it. There you go. I mean, excellent example. That's it's you know just off the top of my head. You know, I'm an artist. I need to. I'm not an artist. Okay. That's anyway, right. so if I I could do that, if I could do that on the spot, because Tommy, who didn't even put her face in the videos, decided to challenge me in front of you. And you stepped up. And I challenge. stepped up. So even if I could do that in two seconds, you with time and Google could do great things. So I think that you should write a haiku and then I will send you a copy of this book. Well, I'll send one of you a copy of this book. So I hope that you enjoyed the interview with Andrea Hairston. Um, that was filmed at WizCon in 2018. Thanks very much for watching. Let's chat in the comments below. Have you read any of Andrea Hairston's work? If not, what are you interested in? And what did you think of the things that she had to say in the interview? I'll see you in the comments. Bye. Bye. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I think we've got it. Yay. Yay. Okay. Hi everyone, so I have um, a YouTube channel called Onyx Pages, and so this is for Onyx Pages. So okay, I do hey everything. Onyx Pages. Hi! <laughs> um, so it's on book. It's on YouTube, which it, and BookTube is sort of like a, do you know about BookTube? No, I don't know about BookTube. It's like a little, commu actually it's a big community of people who make videos about books. So okay. we read books, we talk about them, we, we buy them, we do show and tells, we call those hauls, we do book reviews, and oh. this is an author spotlight with you. Oh, okay. So yeah, um, so that's that's what we're doing. So 
they know that I've been at WizCon because I've put up a couple of videos and I have now recovered yours from the workshop. Okay. So that's going to be up again. Um, so thanks for giving me some of your time. Um, so I had put some questions together and I think my first one that I asked you was, out of everything you've published, um, what's the most inspiring? That's a that's was a that, really hard question. Was that my first question? Yeah, okay, I think good. that was your first question. And I thought about it, and usually uh, I mean, inspiring to me or to audiences. To or you, to, as the writer. Um, wow, because I'm a serial, like, monogamy writer, so every, you know, what I'm doing at the moment is my most inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm right now working on a novel called The Master of Poisons, mm -hmm. and that has me captured, and I'm trying to start another novel that will be called Archangels of Funk, mm -hmm. and I've got two, oh. s two stories of, from that, that um, one will appear in um, Trouble of Waters, mm -hmm. which Cherie Renee Thomas is editing with Pan Wellen, wow. and the other one will be in New Sons, which is edited by Nisi Shaw. So, and these two stories will be part of Archangels of Funk because I don't really, I write short stories under duress, but if they're <laughs> going to be part of a novel, yeah. then I'm like, yeah. So I think those two projects are what is inspiring me, but I'm trying to think, when I decided to write science fiction, I wrote a book called Wilderness, which isn't published, and then the next book I wrote was Mindscape, and that started me off on this whole path um, as a science fiction writer. And then I wrote Redwood and Wildfire, which I consider to be in the same style, but other people thought of it as fantasy. Um, and I'm like, okay, fantasy or, you know, uh, magical realism or, you know, a bunch of things. And I'm like, okay. Um, uh, so uh, I think Archangels of Funk will be back into science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think partly all my books are a part of my big plan. Yeah. So they all have the same uh, inspirational source and they are iterations on me trying to get the story out that I feel needs to be told. What story is that? Well, in particular, um, I am interested in, in um, African, African American um, uh, indigenous wisdom, uh, spiritual practices, cosmology, history, um, so all of that appears in all of my work. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't write anything that doesn't in some way have a reference to Africa and particularly West Africa which is where I've done my research. Um, and I don't really write anything that doesn't engage um, indigenous American mm -hmm. um, cosmology. Uh, I, I'm really like, you know, fighting the empire. Yeah. Um, so that to me is like the most important thing. And by fighting the empire, I mean um, not having the, the wisdom, the beauty, and the um, power of these amazing um, traditions and cosmologies, you know, eradicated. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm also a teacher, so, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so I want to be able to share um, that with everyone as, you know, like my students, but as well as readers. Mm -hmm. And I want them to have a good time as they find out about the Dahomeyan um, women warriors. Mm -hmm. um, and I want them to appreciate what is hoodoo and what is vodun and what are these things that have been batted around in other popular cultural forms. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, you know, and I, I want to have people understand the relationship of the indigenous population in this country to the Africans who came and to the Europeans. So, that, you know, because that's that's what made me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to make sure that we're all um, in that world because I think we could have that world cut off if we just listen to other stories mm -hmm. or other, you know, like films or. Um, so I feel like that's that's always what I'm doing. Hmm. I uh, I really enjoyed the way we saw African African American spirituality, African spirituality, Aboriginal spirituality in Redwood and Wildfire. Oh yes, and how and and how so much of that took place in the woods for me. Yes, in, or in the swamp. Yes, and yes. in a, right in, a, yeah. in, a, in not a built environment. Right. Yeah, exactly, and. Um, 
and also did that the scene not that it's gonna be a spoiler but that's what I do on the channel but oh. the, the scene uh, like the fire um, uh, the fire scene in that, Chicago yeah, yeah that was really powerful right well me. I mean that was an image that I had that yeah. I wanted to talk about the the power of belief yeah and and so you can light a fire with belief or yeah. you can put it out yeah um, so and I felt that belief is a is a community mm -hmm. thing so although the main character Redwood has power she doesn't have it if she can't believe in it herself yeah. or have other people believe in her yeah. and so I think their relationship is about they believe in each other yeah so they magnify their power and they're able to put out a fire in Chicago yeah. um, having deep faith in their humanity and in the world because you know she really wants to burn all those <laughs> those yeah. people out and but that really won't, does. And and that won't be too. good for her that's yeah. you know it would be like satisfying because I almost there was a part of me that wanted to just have them burn because when she's saying <laughs> that that is you know but then I went but what will that do to her because she yeah. already did something similar in an earlier scene and yeah. it wasn't good it wasn't good for her as well yeah so even though there are people who are mad at me for um, killing off that first dude I'm like how can you be mad at me um, you know I was like wow you know Ooh, you know, yeah. And I liked her relationships with animals as well. Yes, that yes, was so really odd. It was the first time I'd read, you know, a character with relationships with animals like that. It was okay, nice. Okay, that's another one of my things. I believe in animal people. Yeah. So I believe they are beings. They are yeah. not just objects of our world. They are right. subjects in their own world. Yeah. And I think that of the plants too. Yeah. So you know, but this relates to again African, <laughs> African American and indigenous um, cosmology. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I'm not like. Um, separate from the natural world mm -hmm. you know I'm engaged with it um, I am of it mm -hmm. um, and so that's really important to me because I think part of our problems is has to do with like sort of you know patriarchal like I control the bodies of you know the women the people and the plants and the animals mm -hmm. and I think that cosmology is not uh, you know I don't believe in it I don't think it's good either so so you talked a little bit about your writing, you talked about your relationship to short stories, which you write under duress, <laughs> but in your love for the novel, but you're also, you're, you're a theater, you're a creator oh, of theatrical art, yeah. and so how does the theater interact with your, uh, your novels? At you know my base I and think. then technology because you're uh, well I was a, as yeah well, I was so. a math physics major as an undergraduate when I was back in the 70s and when I graduated from college I was a math textbook editor mm -hmm. um, and when I was a little girl I thought I was going to be a physicist yeah. or a mathematician or a mathematician slash physicist um, and uh, you know going to high school and college it was really hard at the time I was it was the 60s and the 70s and you know black women being physicists this was not yeah. You know, this is still not. I was the only black woman on a panel at WizCon on artificial intelligence. I'm frequently the only black woman in a group that's dealing with technology. Um, so uh, that's, uh, I'm writing about that in Archangels of Funk. My character is a black woman who was a techie who has left. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like trying to process my own journey, even though her story is different than mine. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel that I am at base a mathematician, that that's, the way I think. That's how I got trained. Um, and then the next layer is theater because mm -hmm. it seemed to go really well with being a mathematician. So my first entry into theater was through technology. Mm -hmm. So people were asking me, can you do special effects? We want a pool of light. And I said, you can't have a pool of light. <laughs> light only bounces off something. You have to have an object that the light hits and then the, that light goes to your eye, but you cannot have a pool of light. And they were arguing with me. I said, look, I'm right. <laughs> have a pool of light. That's why, you know, if I shine a beam, unless there's some junk in yeah. the way, you don't see the light. You see the object that the light hits. So, you know, I'm having this argument. I'm like, okay, but I can make it look like a pool because I can put smoke or, you know, dry ice or something and the particle matters will look like a pool. You put a mirror at the top and, you know, and send the light up. And so they said, well, could you do that? And so then I was in the theater um, doing special effects, making things dissolve, making sound effects, doing lighting because, you know, I was like, well, you can't have that angle. You'll get a really bad shadow. And people were like, what? And then I took, I, I actually never took a lighting class because, you know, I came from physics. So it all seemed clear to me. I was like, oh, I see what they're doing. Oh, this is how the circuits work. Oh, now it's more computers. But at the time, it was just you and the light board um, and the light. Um, so if you knew, like, you know, I knew light. I knew, like, how to program a little bit. Because you don't have to really program. It's just like, okay, we're going to move all these levers mm -hmm. out at once and get this special effect. 
um, and then I could make things and record them. So I entered theater as a techie huh. um, and then a stage manager, which is reverse engineering. Like the show must go up on that date. What do we need to do and how do we need to get all these people together to do it so it will be at that date? So that, that was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. So my first big job um, when I was a sophomore in college was I stage managed um, a show where the, they wanted pools of light and they wanted a table to dissolve on stage. I was like, this is not a film. So you just put some sand down there and we'll say it dissolved and the audience will believe you. It's theater. And I'd done theater my whole life as a little, my mother made me do theater. Okay. She said, you can't put your nose in a book all day long. Hmm. So you gotta go out and do something. So it was theater. So, you know, the director was arguing with me and I was like, really? Just put the sand there. So they tried it and people were like dazzled. They were like, whoa, the table's dissolving. There's the sand, because they hadn't seen it. I said, just put it in the dark yeah. and put a light on it. And it, you know, and it'll look, people will think the table's dissolving. And so the, after that, I was like, I, I, I could do this. Yeah. I mean, you know, I could write for it, I could direct. Um, so when my um, professors who were mathematicians were a little weird about black women with um, dark fingernail polish, bright clothes, wild hair, and they weren't taking me seriously, I, sh I changed my major um, as a junior, mm -hmm. second semester junior, so you know how long, yeah. I was like almost done. Um, to be in theater, yeah. but I had enough theater because I liked it, you know. Um, so, and I was writing. I, I dumped a class and took a writing class because I was like, oh, I don't want to. I have to dump this class. This professor's gonna. I, uh. And so the theater professor said, "Oh, we'll take my playwriting class." I went, "Okay." So that's how I started on playwriting, um, and I loved it. Um, and I went to graduate school in playwriting after being a math textbook editor, um, since I could do words and numbers and understand the science. Um, I got to do that, and that was a very interesting gig. It, I called it Waitressing of the Mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I realized I don't wish to do this, um, so I went to Brown and I got um, a master's in playwriting and worked with a wonderful um, director, George Bass, who um, had directed a show that I saw on television by Alice Childress, and it was called um, Trouble in Mind. And it was about a black woman. It was an intersectional piece before we had that word. Mm -hmm. And it was about a lower class black woman who gets brought to an apartment for a painter to paint because she's the ugliest, beat up, nasty chick. But she doesn't know that. She thinks she's going to be wine in the wilderness. Oh. Uh, and so it's about class and race and gender. And the, the artist is a black man who thinks he knows everything. And uh, my mother and I are watching this, and we have not, this is 1968 or 69. And they're, you know, this is on PBS, and we're like, this is about black people. This is about real stuff. This is, and it, what, there were no white people in the piece. Yeah. It was really about internalized oppression. It was about, you know, gender. It was about class, because it was different classes. She was lower class. They were middle and upper class. She was, quote, uneducated. They were, quote, college educated. And it was, you know, all the struggle. And there was a riot going on outside. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, you know, a really good critique of how class and gender work in a, in a context that was just all black people. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing that. No. We were like, huh? So I said, wow, and I saw that and I loved it. And then later I meet Alice, I write her a letter and I go meet her. Um, but, and I recommend Alice Childress, all of her plays and all, of, she also wrote novels. She wrote A Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich, which was made into a film. And uh, she also wrote, uh, and Cicely Tyson is in that. Oh, cool. Um, and then she wrote a whole bunch of plays, and she wrote a, a, a Short Walk, which is a great novel that was nominated like for a Pulitzer Prize and all that. So Alice is wonderful, wonderful. And she also did a play on Gullah, on the people off of the uh, Georgia Sea Islands. Um, so, but I didn't know I was going to meet Alice. I didn't know I was going to go into theater. I didn't know any of that when I'm watching this play. Um, but it really gave me like, wow, and that stuck in my mind when I was in college. And then my professor, uh, Len Berkman, had a black theater class, and nobody else had that class. This is 1971. Nobody else was teaching it. So, and I was in chemistry, physics, and math. And my friend said, you should take this with me, because I'm going to take this. And so we took it together. Because, you know, you've got to take something outside your yeah, major. the electives. The electives, yeah. yes, the electives. So, we had to, so there we are, and I was like, I'm hooked. And we read all this, these amazing plays. Cool. And I said, okay, this is, this is good. And so that was the professor who let me in the playwriting class. Mm -hmm. And 
then when I wanted to switch my majors because I kept taking his classes and you know doing theater stuff and stage managing mm -hmm. and doing the sound and then so I think I came into the arts through tech so when I get to writing science fiction in the mid 90s I was in Germany teaching a class and I said I feel like an alien because uh, I was in North Germany I've told this story before and all my Germans are southern Germans so I felt like an alien not because I was black in Germany or because I was an American in Germany but because I had imprinted on Bavarians and I was in Hamburg and they were very different mm -hmm. and they were all white people to me so I thought these are all white people why aren't they acting like the people in Munich mm -hmm. um, so that was a very interesting, oh, interesting yeah it was like a mind thing because in America we have race in a way that is very different than I mean they still have race so you know don't let them tell you that they don't have race but they also have different ethnic reality yeah and within their countries and between the countries mm -hmm. so you know mm -hmm. I'm there and people are telling me oh you're practically Italian fast Italianish uh, I'm like no black people do this too you know like the well, hands and yeah. the talking and so they were so they were trying to figure out who they could connect me to sure. that, that made sense funny. to them and if yeah. that was the Italians and I was like that is really funny I, I find that very funny I grew up around Italians me too so I, I, you know I was like oh you know I see I know what you mean but no black right. people this is you know yeah um, this is ours this is right no yeah. you know, we do this we do this yeah. we've been doing this we were yeah. doing it before we lived next door to Italians yeah um, and they were doing what they were doing so yeah. you know it's, it's, it's cool it's everybody cool. can just stay in their lanes yes yeah. right <laughs> Um, but uh, so there that's when I decided to write um, about the the world that becomes mindscape because I was amazed at the different mindscapes mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to talk about and I was at a conference oh yes and at the conference they were telling Africans that they needed to give up their African languages um, and just take on European languages and it was such crap I couldn't even believe it and I had like you know it was a real big argument and Gugi Wathiongo is one of my, you know, decolonizing the mind and a whole, you know, notion of that the, that the language you speak, it creates the world that you inhabit. So I was in that and they were telling me that this was, um, you know, not just optimistic, but, you know, really not possible. You know, so I, I, I'm okay with that's really hopeful or that's optimistic, but I was sort of saying that you cannot have a world in which Africa can be at the center of your language. That's basically the way to, I was like, wow. And you know, and I'm speaking English and German, so I'm like, ooh. So they weren't even actually telling me, they were telling the people from the various African nations that were at this particular conference. And people were arguing, Africans were arguing whether they should just dump, you know, Fula and Yoruba and Igbo wow. and all the, you know, Hausa. I mean, there were a lot of Nigerians there. Um, or whatever other language and just speak English and French and German. I'm it was so a glad deep, that didn't happen. deep, uh, you know, so that was profound. Um, so um, that helped me, I mean, you know, prompted me because I had to respond in some way to that. That, you know, I was like, this is seriously, you need to decolonize your mind. And people were sort of accusing Ngugi Wathiongo of being, you know, um, you know, looking through rose-colored glasses. I'm like, this man got kicked out of his country. What are you talking about? Um, it, you know, I, I, I just felt it was necessary to address that. So, um, and that's why I've been addressing it ever since. You know, I mean, I already knew it, but here was an example of it in the real world. And there were refugees from everywhere there um, when I was there. It was, um, there were a lot of civil wars. Uh, the Sudan was engaged in the civil war. The Eastern Europeans were at each other. Um, and Germany at that particular time had an open border because you know we have been Nazis. So we will um, uh, grant asylum to people for political reasons. Uh, and, and places like the United States weren't doing that. Um, so it was very interesting. So a lot of uh, Asulan, uh, asylum seekers were coming to Germany. Um, so I got to work with some of them on a play. Um, and they, their big thing was, um, well, you're a playwright. You have a world stage. Tell our story. And I was like, I, 
I can't tell your story. You should tell your story. So I was trying to help them tell their stories. And yeah. then they said, yes, but you are a writer. We have, we don't have the tools, the skills, the time, you know, and everything they were saying, I was like, oh my God, this is like, you have the privilege. And I went, oh, but science fiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can tell your story without telling your story. I can talk about the yeah. stuff that's important in your world, in my story, but without appropriating like the, the story you need to tell. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that's another thing that I work on. Like, I don't try to tell stories that I that I don't have enough to, stuff in me to tell. But I hear people saying, but you have the privilege. People are gonna listen to you, buy your books, come to your plays, get my story in there somehow. So yeah, that's a challenge. Do you wanna talk about that? Yes, okay. this is my book, Will Do Magic for Small Change. Um, and in this book, I, in, I uh, have an alien come to West Africa. So one of the ways I deal with telling other people's stories is I'm like, I'm not the expert. This is an alien, this is someone not from this reality um, who comes and tries to understand them. And the first people that the alien meets are Dahomey, um, oh, is a Dahomey warrior woman. Um, and so the alien models itself on her. Oh, cool. Uh, so that's this book. Uh, and this is being read by a young woman. And that, that takes place in the 1890s. So this alien comes to Dahomey in the 1890s. And a young black woman in Pittsburgh in the, 18, uh, the 1980s is reading it. And she's the granddaughter of Redwood and Wild. I knew that. So this is sort of like a prequel, or not? No, a, no, no. This is this context. is a no, no. Redwood and Wildfire is like a prequel to this. To this, okay. Um, but you don't. They're they're both independent books, so you don't yeah, need right to read them, you know, in order or together to get each book. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you read them both, you get a special thing. So in this book, um, she is a young woman, and she's you know like in her teens. Um, and she has, her brother's a gay, uh, and I, this is a spoiler, um, but it's not really a spoiler, he's dead. Um, he's committed <laughs> suicide at the beginning oh of the book, and he's gay, and it's very complicated, and she loves her brother dearly, oh. and um, the people at the funeral are trying to decide whether he's going to go to heaven or hell, or just, you know, rot in the casket. So that's where we begin her story. Right. And reading about these Dahomeyan women and this alien, this is a book her brother gave her, mm -hmm. um, helps her. Okay. And she's a theater artist, and she's really interested in theater. And eventually, she, you know, she's, she's a geek, she's isolated. Um, and her brother, who was her main source of, you know, like, oh my God, you understand me, he's gone. Yeah. Um, but her grandparents show up, Redwood and Wildfire okay. show up. So her elders come. Her mother's having a hard time because you'll find out in the book. <coughs> Excuse me. And she meets um, two young people at an audition. And so, and they end up in a kind of polyamorous relationship. Oh, cool. So, um, and the alien is, you know, non-binary gender. It's just imprinted on the Dahomey women who don't have the same feminine gender qualities that women have. So it's very interesting, you know, all the things that the young people have to do to reconcile this in the 80s. So that's what this book is that about. That just moved right up onto the top of my to be read, to, to read list. That's so great. I will give you the book. The, I have a copy of it. Oh, you have I a copy. Bought it. Okay. I, I want another copy of it, but I I will ha I will give it to gift it to somebody. All right. Okay. Can I do that? Yes, you can. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate so that. So I brought it to give to you. So yeah, yeah. I love it when people give me stuff. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, I um I actually ordered it, um, and I featured it on one of my on my videos. Okay. I was telling you we do haul videos where yes. we talk about oh we bought this thing and this thing and this thing and. Um, okay. It's a bit consumerist, but I, I'm not mad at that because I like buying. This is a good. These are good buys, right? This very. Book, you won't buys. necessarily find out about it unless someone like you tells the world. Yeah. So um, thank and, you. You know what I'm gonna do? I am gonna do a giveaway on the channel. Oh, okay. Yes. So the, and I will sign the book. Yes. And uh, you know that would be great. Okay, great. Uh, and so, you will let me know when you're doing it. And yes. So basically, we can just do it right now. So basically, how the the way giveaways work is, if you would like a copy of We'll Do Magic for Small Change, then maybe we can get them to. The last one that I did, I asked them to write haikus. 
Oh, okay. about about the story and what they yeah, thought about it. I love that. And then I chose a haiku at random, and then I I'm gonna send it to the person who wrote the haiku. Would you like to do that yes, kind of thing? Yes, that sounds or, great. Or you can choose. No, that a sounds great. Question. No, okay. no, I love that. One. So we're gonna do the haiku giveaway yeah, again. Yeah. So if you are interested in a, a copy of Will Do's uh, Magic for Small Change by Andrea Hairston. Please write a haiku, put it in the comments, and then maybe let's say uh, on June 15th, I will wow. look at all of the uh, at the okay. haikus, and, and maybe I'll send them to you and you can choose. Oh, okay, well, we I can do it together. It together. Yes. We will do it together. We'll together. You'll pick your favorites and I'll pick my yeah. favorites and then you can decide. Okay, that sounds yes. good. Okay. Yes. Well, and this got the Lambda, it was nominated mm -hmm. for a Lambda. Um, it was nominated for the Tip Tree, mm -hmm. and it was a Mythopoetic um, mm -hmm. uh, finalist. Okay. So, um, and the cover art, can we just take a look oh, at the, the cover, cover art? Can you tell us about that? Okay, so I... Um, I work with Aqueduct, and what is really good is that authors usually have no input yeah. on the covers. Um, but I, I, my first cover, I didn't have much input on, um, and I said, "Look, you know, I, I work with a visual artist. I'm a theater artist, yeah. and I know, uh, you know, a really good scene designer. And he is what he does is, you know, read a play and make a set. So I will ask him. Yeah. Um, so he's done all of my covers. So he did Redwood and Wildfire. He did Lonely Stardust, mm. and he did um, Will Do Magic. And I, I like masks. <laughs> if yes. you look at the covers, you know, or faces." Or, or, or those sorts of things and I want the audience to know what sort of book you are getting yes um, you know I want That's it so to helpful. be like this is if, if you look at that mask you have a sense of what's in this book yeah um, and so his name is Nick Ularu um, and I worked well actually I didn't get a chance to work with him um, on theater projects but I loved all the theater projects that um, he worked on and he's Romanian Mm. Um, and so I make him read these books, and his first language is not English. Um, so he's he's reading, and he goes, "Oh my goodness!" You know, he's working, and then he gives me images like this. It's really beautiful. It's uh, and compelling. Then the redwood and wildfire image. He, yeah. He, uh, you know. And then, that one was hard to look. I found it hard to look at. Okay. Um, yeah, I found myself lost in the darkness of the face, uh, and in the in the tree and the hair slash leaves and and the fire. Yeah, it was really, it was a really compelling image. It was an arresting image. Yeah. And I found that I couldn't look at it for very long. It felt like the story. Okay, so that's what Nick does. Yeah, it felt uh, like the story. And so this one, um, there's a boat down here because we spend oh, okay. time on the water. And so, you know, he really, and there there's, should be some stuff on bridge. I'll hear the bridges. Mm, mm. So he, okay. he, all the details of the story, yeah. he incorporates even more bridge stuff. Okay. Um, so he's a really, he's a it's masterful nice. artist. It's really beautiful. Um, and, um, and also, um, what I, he does this for free. Mm. And then he says, well, if I do that, will you look at stuff that I've written in English and help him with the English? So we do this wonderful nice trade. trade. So he writes plays um, in English, you know, but English isn't his first language. So I tried to help him make the play like English English, not mm. just Romanian English, or leaving it Rom Romanian English when it was like, oh, this, this works, yeah. you know, so. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's Nick, um, and I, I, I'm now working on the third book, which is Archangels of Funk, um, and the, the three characters from this are old now, and so I want to see what happens to them. So, so do I. Right, so for me, um, uh, like Redwood and Wildfire is my most heterosexual book, because Mindscape... I did it, note that in my review. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mindscape is not like that, <laughs> but, but, but I was like, but these are those people, so... Yeah. Um, uh, these are Cinnamon's grandparents, and so I was trying to write this book, yeah. but their story kept saying, you've got to tell their story. So I said, okay, okay, I'll come back to Cinnamon, and I will, and they were, they are heterosexual. Yeah. And so I was like, wow, okay. You know, and so that was a surprise to me, but I actually think I follow my muse. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you write, uh, wow, you're writing this whole heterosexual love story. Oh my God, and people were sort of like, yeah. But it was the story I had to tell to tell this story. I felt like in Redwood and, and Wildfire, there was an opportunity for a healthy gay romance, and we just didn't see very much of, of it. Like, it just kind of, it was, just, I, I don't remember, I remember visually that there's a, there's a meeting or something. There's a meeting of people, there's a gathering of people, oh. and we meet, what is his name? 
uh, Walter Jumping Bear, the the at the Indi the group of Indians. Yeah, but and because because well, Walter takes um, Aiden to that meeting, and then yes. Walter meets a woman there. No, there's a gay. There's a gay, oh 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 there's oh, a gay oh, oh. Uh, oh right, and we um, only sort of get uh, the, a Redwood's best friend. Yes. Redwood's best yeah. friend who um, is having um, whose partner is a uh, a, a working uh, union man yeah. and and he invites everybody to his house That's all the time because this these are typical so I did research this is yeah. like oh this stuff this is what happened yeah. and so they had a, a party because the, the Chicago World's Fair brought all these different kinds of people yeah. to Chicago and the theater artists were wild and woolly um, and so um, uh, the two of them, you know, aren't, and then there's Doc and um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the the driver, Doc and his driver, yeah. and then, so they're two actually, um, but they're not part of the the central, well, no, actually the, the acrobat is her best friend. Yeah, um, so it I, felt like there could have been I could have gone more, further yeah. with that, yeah. Um, but I was, it wasn't that I was trying not to tell their story, mm. um, I was focused on, um, and and to me that they're there is totally important so it wasn't that but i was focused on what are the moments i need to tell redwood and wildfire's story mm -hmm. um and if i rewrote that or if i did it again i might do it differently than i you know um and in this story it's the center it's yeah. not like yeah and also the the alien and the um I won't spoil everything, but the alien and the adult main women, it's very interesting, their relationship. Oh! Yes, right? Ooh. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so, that's the center. Both characters are in queer relationships. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm looking And so to that's, this. Um, I think, yeah. So, th this one, like, is centered on that. Yeah. And so will um, Archangels of Fun. Oh, I'm looking forward same, to it. It's these characters older. Mm. Um, so to me, um, part of that colonial empire imperialist thing is also a control of gender expression and sexuality. Yeah. Um, so I want to blow yeah. that apart. So. so just on my last question then, um, I, I believe that the, Im the imagination is a really powerful tool. It's, a, it's an emancipatory right. tool. It's used all the time, yeah. but not always consciously. Right. And one of the things that I love about Afrofuturism, or I've come, I've heard about this new term through Tempest Bradford, who said that Nisi Shaw describes Everfair mm -hmm. as a Afro retro futurist mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that was the term. Mm -hmm. I'm just just wrapping my tongue around it. Um, but I think that that what Afrofuturism does is it gives us new models, yes. right? Yes. And it allows us to tell the past differently. Yes. And, yes. and in doing so, I think, it sort of it frees us. It changes the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's and changes the past. Yeah, right. right? So, like, yeah, just, right. Because yeah. all of these things are stories we tell. Yeah. The past, the present, and the future. It's yeah. a story we tell. And so when we change the story, it changes the whole time. So, so then the queer voice, the black yeah. queer voice, in your view, given that you've now you know, turned your mind to centering queerness, gender queerness, um, challenging like monogamy, which you did in Redwood and Wildfire anyhow, which I don't, and I don't even think that monogamy is sort of the, the natural way if we look at how, just like nuclear families in, in, in African communities are not necessarily no. how we do things. Um, but in any event, yeah. um, what contributions do you see um, queer voices and queer storylines making to Afrofuturism as a whole? Well, one, I feel like that, I think I said this in my paper and I've said it in another article, normal is the secret weapon of the empire. Whatever normal is, is a way of maintaining the status quo. Mm -hmm. And normal is like what like we all are like facing and have to wrap ourselves around. And I think that Afrofuturism like shakes up normal. Mm -hmm. um, so one normal thing is that um, the, the past is stuck 
uh, and that we're stuck in the past if we're quote primitive and that's just a story we tell mm -hmm. so we can tell a different story um, so the possible solutions to how to relate to people you love are like whoa there's a huge number of those um, and that you know for me the patriarchal control of bodies and genders is is about like economic control of the products of those bodies and you know so that it, it and it's all interconnected and so I think that Afrofuturist queer voices can disrupt that can can just really shake up what we think is possible and once we have a what I call the magic if or you know what you know Stanislavski called the magic if but the idea that once we start thinking we can go well oh well, what if I did this and it breaks up normal mm -hmm. you know suddenly you realize normal is not you know sort of an obligatory absolute natural state but a set of choices that we have made and that we have agreed to or that we have not agreed to but have internalized yeah and so if you want to, I mean, a lot of speculative fiction is about upsetting normal. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, for me, Afrofuturism is also about the past. Um, so I view the, you know, so I view um, Redwood and Wildfire as Afrofuturist because once I tell that story, I can finally write yeah. the story that I'm going to write after this one, yeah. Archangels of Funk, which takes place 20 years from now. And I couldn't write that story without giving it a pass. Yeah. So I had to have the whole, you know, because time is simul you know, simultaneous rather than linear. Yes. So I sit on my ancestors. And if I don't know who they are, I sit unconsciously on them. And it's very different to sit consciously on your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And then to interrogate who they might have been is about what I want to be and who I might become. Right. So I want to do all that, and that's really important. And I, I start that work in this book. And I, you know, I started it in Redwood and Wildfire. Yeah, I think so. Certainly the relationship between Redwood and her mother. Oh, yes. Like through dimension, like across yeah, dimensions. Yeah, right. And Cinnamon will have, you know, so Cinnamon, I start the uh, next book with Cinnamon at the graves of Redwood and Wildfire. Mm. So, you know, and she's trying, and she's 60. Yeah. After being, I think, you know, 13. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's like, how do we stay connected to the ancestors? It's that moment in Black Panther where they have to take in the drug and go in underneath the yeah. stuff. You, you meet the ancestors, and it's not just for them to tell you what to do. That's to me what Afrofuturism is about. Yeah. It's for you to say, y'all were wrong about this. You know, you were beautiful and great about all that, but you were wrong about this, and I'm going to change because we yeah. have a tradition of change, yeah. not a tradition of let's just keep doing what we were doing, even though it's like very destructive. Yeah. So what I think the, 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 the power of, of T'Challa saying, you know, you were wrong, is, is to face the ancestors without having to, to wipe them out. Yeah. You know, so that, because we don't have to get rid of them. We could just like, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. The way we would with people here, right? But we wouldn't toss out all the wisdom they had, because that, that would really be stupid. Yeah. So um, that's something I want to do in my practice. Like, what do I want to maintain? And what do I, you know, and what can sustain me um, as I make a future world? Right. So. Yeah, and we'll do magic for small change as part of that. Yay! Well, yes. thank you so much. You are welcome. It's and really good to meet you. Yes, and I hope to get to Toronto and visit you. Yes, and, you know, you're welcome. Yes.